My name is Usman Saroud and I am a software engineer at Yelp. I've been working at Yelp for the last one and a half years and before that I was doing my PhD in high performance computing uh, from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I'm here to talk about Siegel, which is a highly fault tolerant distributed system for concurrent task execution that we've been working on uh, developing at Yelp in the last year or so. Before going into that, I have to share a few things about what Yelp is. Yelp is a company, a rapidly growing company that is connecting people with great local businesses. People write reviews, and before that people go to businesses, and then they write reviews, which in turn help other users to select which business to interact with. As of Q2 2015, we had 83 million monthly visitors on mobile. We had around 83 million reviews. 68% of our searches were conducted from mobile and we are present in 32 countries. So, you guys are here and I thank you for that. So what is in this talk for you guys to get out of it? I'm going to show how Yelp runs millions of tests in a single day, how it downloads terabytes of data in an extremely efficient manner, and how do we scale our Siegel cluster, which I'll talk to you about later, based on our custom metric, which we use for scaling. I'm not going to share a lot of code over here because I'm not good at uh, sharing code in my talk and for some reason I find it uh, to be very boring when I share <laughs> code in my talks. So it's going to be a high level architecture talk and uh, I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with Apache Mesos, although it's not a hard requirement because I have a couple of uh, slides where I'm going to go over what exactly happens when we use Apache Mesos and how it actually operates. So what exactly is Siegel? Siegel is a distributed system that allows concurrent tasks to run at very large scale. And while doing that, it also makes sure that we achieve a high cluster utilization. Siegel is also highly fault tolerant and resilient to failures. Although Siegel can be used at, uh, in, in different ways, but currently we use Siegel for running millions of tests at Yelp. So what's a typical use case for Siegel? There is this Yelp developer which is sitting on his computer, he goes to a terminal and just punches Siegel dash runs. What it does is it triggers a Siegel build. Siegel does all the magic it's supposed to do. It runs all the tests that it needs to run for that developer, and at the end, it generates a report, which we can see on the bottom right-hand side, that the developer then can go and see to find out, did he make any tests fail, or if he, did, if he created any problems with uh, the service that he's working on. I'm going to start by talking about how Siegel works, and then I'm going to focus and narrow down onto one specific problem, which is probably the biggest problem we faced while implementing Siegel and later on uh, doing the global, its global availability. And then I'll, at the end, I'll conclude with talking about how we scale, uh, auto-scale Siegel cluster and how did we make it fault tolerant? So, how does, how does Siegel work? And even before that, what's, what's the challenge? Why did we make Siegel? So it turns out that every single day, Siegel runs tests that would take 700 days to run in serial. On average, 
we do 350 seagull runs in a day. And each of these seagull runs runs approximately 70,000 tests. Each seagull run, that is, each of these 70,000 tests would take two days to run in serial. Our demand for running seagull is fairly volatile, but the good thing is that it's predictable as well. So 30% of all the seagull runs that we do, they happen between a three hour period, which is usually 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., unless or until there is a free lunch at Yelp, which can move an hour either way. So, what do we do at a very high level? We run 3,000 tests concurrently on a 200 machine cluster. What does that fetch us? It reduces the time for a single run from two days, which it would take if, if you would run it in serial, to just 14 minutes. But it's easier said than done. Running at such high scale involves a lot of challenges. Some of them being like downloading 36 terabytes of data in a single day. And there are, in, 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 during the peak hours, we are downloading as much as five terabytes in a single hour. We can trigger up to 200 simultaneous downloads for a single large file, which is hundreds of megabytes. And almost every day, we pull, start, stop, more than 1.5 million Docker containers. And at peak times, we can pull, start, and stop as much as 210,000 Docker containers in a single hour. So what goes inside Seagull? All these wonderful technologies, we combine them, and uh, that's basically what Seagull is made up of. We use signal effects in Kibana for monitoring Seagull. That tells us how healthy Seagull is and if there are any problems going on with it. We use S3, or actually we started using, by, uh, we started using S3 as our artifact host. And we use DynamoDB and Elasticsearch for reporting purposes. But at the heart of Seagull lies the EC2 compute cluster, which runs Apache Mesos, Jenkins, and Docker for us. So this figure shows a detailed map of what's inside Seagull. The developer sitting on his table starts Seagull. That's the triggering point. What it does is it starts a Jenkins build. Jenkins pulls the code, the, the code that we are supposed to test, compiles the Python files, and uploads the compiled code to S3. The next thing it's Jenkins is supposed to do is to determine the list of tests that we are supposed to run. Once the list of tests is determined, that's passed to the prioritizer, which takes in the list of tests that we are supposed to run, and it determines the exact order in which the tests are supposed to run. The prioritized test list is then fed The prioritized test list is then fed to Seagull schedulers, which takes the text test list, bundles them according to whatever the priority is, and these schedulers are sitting on top of Apache Mesos, which in turn uses EC2 machines as Seagull slaves to actually run the tests. Once the tests have finished to completion, and uh, what, uh, while running the test, we also pull artifacts, which is a very important point. We pull artifacts from S3 and then run the test on the slave, SQL slaves, and the results are then reported to DynamoDB, Elasticsearch for reporting purposes, and SignalFX and Kibana for monitoring purposes. Once the results are there in DynamoDB and Elasticsearch, SQL UI goes ahead and it fetches those results and finally, the results are displayed to the developer who started the run. 
So I'm going to drill down to each of these separate modules and explain what exactly is going on within each of them. Once a developer triggers the run, it triggers a Jenkins build. We run Jenkins as a cluster of seven R3 8x large machines. Its job is to build our largest service, which I'm going to uh, explain in a little detail a little later. Once it's done building the service, it uploads the artifact to S3. So whenever I'm referring to artifact for the rest of the talk, I'm basically referring to this largest service, the compiled version of this largest service. We upload the artifact to Amazon S3, and Jenkins triggers the job which goes ahead and discovers tests. So what is Yelp Artifact? Yelp Artifact is basically the compiled version of our largest service that forms a major part of our website. It consists of hundreds of megabytes, and it takes around 10 minutes to build the artifact. It uses a lot of memory, and because there's a huge setup cost, we do not build our artifact on each of the slaves which are actually running the test, and instead, we build it once and upload to S3, and all the, all the slaves that are responsible to run the test, they pull it from S3 and use it for running the tests. Once the build is done, we now st start the next phase, which is the test discovery phase. We take the compiled artifact, and in this phase, we determine what are the test names that we actually need to run. It's, uh, it's a process where we just pass a bunch of Python files to extract the actual test names, and it takes around two minutes to complete. Right now, we have seven different test suites, so we generate a test list for each of these seven suites. So right now, we've seen the Yelp developer triggers a build. We saw what, what's, what happens inside Jenkins. It builds and generates a test list. And now we are going to look at what's, in, what's happening inside the prioritizer. A test prioritizer works on a very simple notion. It's schedule the longest tests first. And the way we do that is we maintain the test timing data in DynamoDB. So the prioritizer takes the test list and combines it with the historical test timing data, which comes from DynamoDB. And based on that, it generates an ordered list which is going to tell the schedulers the order in which it should run the tests. And we use DynamoDB due to several different reasons, one of which is that we don't need to maintain it, and that's a very good thing to do because maintaining data stores is a big pain, and we have had several trouble with other uh, technologies that we have tried to use. And the other thing is, our table only costs around $200 per month, which is very cheap, and it's extremely reliable. We haven't had uh, any trouble with it, and uh, needless to mention that we do more than 25 million fetches in a single day, and it's been working very well. So after looking at the prioritizer, we now look at what's, what's inside the, what's happening inside the heart of Siegel, as I call it. And how do Siegel schedulers interact with Mesos, and how does Mesos coordinates with the slave to actually run the tests? So what exactly are we trying to do over here? We need to run 350 Seagull runs, roughly, in a single day. Each of these runs has around 70,000 tests, 
which means that in a single day, we are supposed to run somewhere around 25 million tests. Each of these runs, which is a set of 70,000 tests that we need to run for every developer, can take up to 48 hours if run in serial. And the most challenging part out of that is that the demand for Seagull varies a lot. The figure that you see at the bottom of this slide shows the number of Seagull runs submitted per 10 minutes. And it's showing you for a single day. It's quite noticeable that for most of the day, there are not a lot of Seagull runs. And almost 90% of the Seagull runs occur in when it's daytime in the US. That's somewhere around from 9, 9 a.m. to around 7 p.m. And what hurts, what's even difficult to tackle is the peak that you can see occurs after 4 p.m. So let's start with a brief introduction for Apache Mesos. Apache Mesos is a resource management system. It's a piece of software which part of it runs on Mesos master, and the other part of it runs on every slave. So there are two different processes to it. Mesos master runs of them on the master, and Mesos slave processes run on every slave. Slaves, whenever they come online, they register their resources with Mesos master. So every slave will, will come in and register itself and tell that I have these many CPUs, these many, this, many, this much amount of memory, and if you're using ports for allocation, that bit as well. And there are schedulers, which in our case are Siegel schedulers that are responsible for bundling up tests and scheduling them on the slaves. These schedulers subscribe to Mesos master for consuming these resources, which are the, uh, the Seagull, which are provided by the Seagull slaves. Once the schedulers have subscribed, Meso, Mesos master will offer resources to these schedulers in a fair manner. Seagull leverages resource management abilities of Apache Mesos. And what happens is that whenever someone triggers, a Yelp developer triggers a Seagull run, a Mesos scheduler is created. And each of this, these schedulers, in turn, distribute all the work amongst 600 workers, which I'll be referring to as executors for the rest of this talk. So you have, a, you have these 70,000 tests, and you bundle them into 600, 600 executors, and then each of these executors in return run on one of the 200 slaves that our Seagull cluster has. So we currently use our, all R3 8x large machines, which have 32 hardware threads, as well as 256 gigabytes of RAM. So I'm going to demonstrate how Seagull operates with, uh, with an animation. And this is the terminology that I'm going to use in the following animation. So all red squares will represent a single test. Whenever you see like a bunch of them, it represents a bundle, which is a set of tests. And that's the atomic level at which you can distribute work to, uh, to Seagull slaves. Blue boxes signify a scheduler, or you can say it roughly correlates to, it actually correlates, there's a one-to-one -one uh, correlation between a Seagull scheduler and a Seagull run. And the green boxes will represent Seagull slaves. So, how does everything start? A Yelp developer comes in and submits a Seagull run. Once the developer submits a run, a Seagull scheduler is created. The Seagull scheduler gets 
the prioritized test list and it divides them into set of tests which are also called bundles. Once the bundles are made and the scheduler subscribes to Mesos Master, Mesos Master offers it resources. Like in this case, Mesos is offering it, offering scheduler C1 resources from slave S1. The scheduler accepts the offer and it tells Mesos to launch these two bundles on slave S1. Once that's happened, another developer, user two, comes in and he submits a Siegel run. When, when that happens, a separate scheduler, C2, is created and the tasks are once again bundled and in this case, the tasks are bundled to three different bundles or three different set of tests. It, sub it subscribes to Mesos Masters and once it subscribes, Mesos makes it an offer from, for, for resources from slave S1. Scheduler C2 is intelligent in the sense that it looks at the offer and it says, okay, I can only use this offer to run one of the bundles because the, other, the rest of slave S1 is occupied. So it tells Mesos to launch one bundle on it, which gets launched. Mesos then offers scheduler C2 resources from slave S2. The scheduler accepts the offer and it tells Mesos to launch the remaining two bundles on slave S2. Once that happens, these tests, uh, they, these executors run and they finish to completion and the results are reported and that, and that uh, the, and the, and the results are reported to Siegel UI. So after having a brief overview of what exactly happened in Siegel, let's focus on the main challenge that we faced while developing Siegel. And that was got to do with downloading the artifact. So what's so special about and what's, why does this make everything so critical? Why is artifact downloading so critical? Each executor needs to have the artifact before running the tests. And at peak times, they, we, we can run 18,000 executors in a single hour, which means that we can generate up to 18,000 requests for downloading the artifact. Each of this, these requests is for a very large file that can be hundreds of megabytes. And to worsen things up, if out of the 600 executors that we make corresponding to a single Siegel run, if even one of them gets delayed, it's going to delay the entire Siegel run. So it's very important for us to make all the 600 executors fail at roughly the same time. So we've looked at Jenkins, we've looked at prioritizer, we looked at how schedulers are interacting with the Apache Mesos. So now we are going to look what happens inside the slaves when we are actually running the tests. So this is a typical life cycle of the executor. Each executor starts by downloading the artifact from S3. Once the artifact is downloaded, the executor starts a bunch of Docker containers which are in, in turn running services. Once the services are up and running, the tests start running and the tests are in turn using these services and after the tests have finished running, we report results to DynamoDB as well as Elasticsearch and we report metrics to Kibana and SignalFX. This whole process takes around 10 minutes on average. But the main problem out of all these steps that I mentioned is fetching the artifact. So let's just take a deeper look at what happens and how do we fetch artifacts. 
and I did not make this tea go below. This is something weird, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to use the same terminology with uh, a square represents a test and then we have a set of tests, the schedulers and the slave, but I'm going to add two new things to it. A box is now going to represent an artifact and it's, it's important to notice that one, one scheduler, let's say scheduler C1, only needs the, the same artifact A1. So all 600 executors for scheduler C1 need to download the same artifact A1. And the, in the brown box, I'm representing, it, it shows the executor. And this, the label C1 shows that this executor belongs to scheduler C1. There are two critical things that are there inside, this, inside the executor. One of them is the bundle, which is the set of tests that it's supposed to run, and the other one is the artifact which is used to run, which is used to running the tests. So what happens typically when a scheduler C1 starts? When it starts, we distribute, the scheduler C1 distributes all the tests that are there into 600 executors. Each of these executors download their own artifact. And typically, an executor takes around 10 minutes to complete. The memory and CPU requirements for running these tests are such that each slave ends up running 15 executors concurrently at the same time. And that is the reason that for running all 600 executors at the same time for a single seagull, for a single seagull run, we, we need 40 slaves. But if you think about it, if there are 200 seagull, if there are 200 seagull slaves and each of them can run 15 executors at a given time and given the life cycle of a typical executor is 10 minutes, we can run up to 18,000 executors per hour, which roughly cor cor corresponds to around 13.5 terabytes of data that we have to download in a single hour. So the executors start, they want to download the artifact, all of them go and hit S3. We started downloading artifacts from S3 in that manner, and that didn't work very well. We had a lot of requests that took more than 30 minutes, which was completely not acceptable, and uh, it was basically uh, going up to that point that Seagull wasn't really useful. And we found out that the main reason for that was we were choking NAT boxes, and this happened a year ago. At that time, avoiding NAT boxes wasn't very easy. Uh, right now, we have end, there are endpoints that we can use to avoid NAT boxes, but we weren't aware of those endpoints at that time. And using public IPs wasn't very easy for us since uh, our security team had uh, some concerns about it. And as always, we being a company wanted to get a solution as quick as possible. So, what did we do? We started with a few basic optimizations. So as I mentioned previously, a single scheduler needs the same artifact. And there are cases where multiple executors corresponding from the same Seagull run can be running on the same actual slave on the same machine. So instead of downloading an artifact, instead of each of those executors downloading the same artifact again, why not download the artifact once for the same Seagull run per slave, and then all the executors for the same Seagull run share their artifact? So like in this case, slave one is running two executors from scheduler C1, and slave 40 is also running two schedulers from, for, from, for slave, uh, for scheduler C2. So instead of downloading their own artifacts, they can download artifact A1 and A2 once and then share them. But it has its own disadvantages. One of it is that we really wanted to keep each executor independent of the other, but now that they're sharing artifacts, it's violating uh, 
the the in, the the, dip, the, interdip, the independence. And the other problem was that we had to implement a locking mechanism to stop multiple executors for this, from the same scheduler to start downloading artifact on the same physical machine at the same place. But it still didn't scale. So what did we try next? We resorted to a very naive solution where we just brought up a bunch of actually nine R3 ATX large machines and we named it as our artifact cache. And we started replicating every single artifact that we made on each of these nine machines. And at front of it, we put Nginx for load balancing purposes. So all the download requests will go to Nginx, and Nginx will load balance the request and assign it to each of the nine, uh, one, of the, one of the nine artifacts, the machines that we have in the artifact cache. And given that these machines have a bandwidth of 10 gigabits per second, it really helped us starting running Seagull runs for a lot of users. So let's consider some numbers. The top figure over here shows the average download time per 10 minutes for a single download. So we average, we consider a time span of 10 minutes and we Average, I mean, we take the average of all the downloads that happened in that 10 minutes. And we, we, this graph shows the average download times per 10 minutes for a 24 hour period. The bottom figure shows the number of active schedulers, once again for each 10 minutes, for the same amount of time. Generally, we were able to achieve a, an average download time of around 30 seconds. But as you can see from this figure, there's a, there's a correlation between the number of active schedulers and the average download times. At peak times, when there were a lot of schedulers running and in turn a lot of executors being created, we still ended up choking the artifact caches. And the, the, the average download time went from 30 seconds to something around 20 minutes. And once again, at, at peak times, it was very difficult to operate Seagull. So what did we do next? We realized that we have 200 R3-8X large machines, which have immense bandwidth if used the right way. So we started thinking on a distributed artifact hosting scheme, where we would use our entire cluster, instead of the dedicated nine machines, to host artifacts. The good thing about this scheme is that it would scale as we would scale our cluster. We, we put in more nodes to our cluster, the, the artifact uh, will have more nodes to hold, host the artifacts as well. And just to give you some approximate numbers, using the centralized caching scheme where we had nine dedicated cache which replicated all the artifacts, we were allowing approximately 30 megabits per second to each executor. 30 megabits per second download speed to each of the executors. And that's just, uh, that's just based on the calculation that we have nine machines, each of which could support, ten, has a bandwidth of 10 gigabits per second. And when we, when this, this bandwidth is spread across 3,000 executors, it comes out to be roughly 30 megabits per executor. However, using the distributed caching approach, we now have 200 machines, each of which has a bandwidth of 10 gigabits per second. And now, the bandwidth per executor is much, much higher. It's somewhere around 666 megabits per second. So let's just consider a simple example of how this works. Let's say that we have four slaves in our cluster. We do the Jenkins build, which creates the artifact, and then it invokes this random selector which identifies at random two machines out of these four machines to host the artifact A1. So in this case, it uploads the artifact to A1 and A3. So now, for the Seagull run, that is whenever an executor for scheduler C1 needs to download the artifact, it will go to one of slave one or slave three. This scheme ended up being very scalable. 
And the best part was that we didn't need to maintain extra machines. So compared to the earlier scheme where we are replicating all our builds on the nine central artifact caches, we significantly, we very frequently ran into out of space disk issues because every single build will have to be uploaded to each of the nine machines. And we significantly improved the download times as well. This figure shows the average download time, once again, for uh, 10 minutes uh, intervals for 24 hours at the tops. And on the bottom, we are showing the number of downloads occurring in each of the 10 minutes for the same period. And it's evident from this figure that as we go from zero downloads to around 1,000 downloads, our average download time only increased by a factor of two. So it usually was around 10 seconds, so it would go up to 20 seconds, which was a significant improvement over all the previous things that we have tried. So at this time, we thought, can we improve on this? And it turns out that peak times have some nasty characteristics, but they can also be helpful at some times. So during peak times, what ended up happening was that there would be, a, there would be lots of downloads. And most artifacts would end up being downloaded on almost 90% of the slaves. So we thought, once a machine downloads an artifact, it should really start serving download request for that artifact. The, the disadvantage for it is that we need to do some additional bookkeeping. But as we, I'll share later, the benefits that we got out of it, they far outweigh the bookkeeping, bookkeeping disadvantage that it had. So here's an ex example which demonstrate how does stealing actually works. So Jenkins does the build and it randomly selects one slave, in this case, to upload artifact A2. In the next time step, there's an executor that's, that's uh, for scheduler C2 that starts on slave two. This executor needs to fetch artifact A2 and it goes to slave four to fetch that artifact. Once this happens, we get two more schedulers, two more executors that start on slave one and slave three for the same scheduler. Both of these executors also need to fetch artifact A2. Without stealing, both of them would go to the original slave which had the artifact, which is slave four in this case. But here's how stealing would help. Slave three would still go to slave four to fetch the artifact A2. However, slave one would go to slave two instead of going to slave four and steal the artifact. So this, is, this, was a, this was a way to distribute the request once the Siegel schedulers, uh, the Siegel executors start and they start downloading artifacts from other machines. And we saw a significant improve in our average download times, for, especially for stealing artifacts. So the top figure shows the artifact steal time, which is uh, really the artifact download time, but for, uh, from places where it wasn't originally uploaded to. And the bottom figure once again shows the number of steals, which is the number of downloads for that 10 minute period. It's, it's very good to notice that in this case, we can go from zero downloads to up to 600 downloads, and the average download or steal time only increased from four seconds up to like seven seconds. This is a visualization which will show how the artifact download requests are distributed over our entire cluster. So each of these rectangles represent a Siegel slave. A bright green color means that in that two minute period, which each of the frame represents, so a, green, a bright green color represents that in that two minute period, that slave did not get any download request. Whereas a bright red color means that during that two minute period, that 
slave got around eight downloads. And the blue bar on the right hand side shows the average download time across the entire cluster. So this visualization starts from uh, around 12.30 p.m. and it goes up to like 7 p.m. So when it starts, we don't have a lot of runs going on and there are not a lot of requests for artifacts. But as we hit the peak times, that is around 3 o'clock, 3 to 4 o'clock, we get lots of requests. And they appear to be fairly well distributed over the cluster. We cannot achieve perfect load balance over here because it's not a central load balancing scheme that is at play. But if you look at the average download times, our average download time never went above 20 seconds after using the scheme. So now shifting gears, I'll now come to the last part, which is explaining how did we auto scale our cluster and how did we make Seagull fault tolerant. The number of Seagull runs that we get changes with time. And as I mentioned earlier, when it's daytime in the US, we get lots of Seagull runs, which also points out that we don't need to maintain a 200 instance cluster throughout the day and night. We can easily scale it down and then bring it up. To start with, we use the default auto scaling policy provided by AWS, but we ran into a few problems with it because it didn't allow us to specify what slave we want to terminate. But you might think, why would we want this ability to tell the policy that these are the slaves that I want to terminate? Well, it happens so that Mesos uses a first in, first out strategy to assign work to slaves. And the default auto scaling policy chooses slaves to terminate based on FIFO strategy as well. So what would end up happening is, let's say if we have 10% of slaves that are actually running tests and the remaining 90% of the machines are sitting idle, and the auto scaling policy triggers, it says, okay, I am going to terminate 10% of the slaves. What it will end up doing is, it will choose those 10% slaves that are the only slaves that are doing any work and it will terminate them. So we need to find a way around it. And okay. Please. Okay, that's good. That's better. <laughs> so we do, we define this notion of reserved memory. The CPU and memory demand for a test is very volatile. So what we, what we told Siegel was that Siegel should tell Mesos to reserve the maximum amount of memory a task ever requires. Let's denote this by RI. Given RI, the total memory required to run a set T of tasks that are currently running on the entire cluster, we can simply calculate it by summing up all the RIs over the set T. And once again, set T represents all the tasks that are currently running on the entire cluster. And if we define MI to be the total available memory for slave I, and set S to denote all the slaves present inside our cluster, the total available memory of our cluster would be the sum of MI over the set S. So given that, we now can define gull load, which is the metric that we use for auto scaling, as the ratio of total reserved memory to total available memory, or sum of Ri over set T upon sum of Mi's over set S. So this is a typical behavior of gull load. This is how the value for gull load changes over a single day. When it's peak time, around 4 p.m. or after 4 p.m., we are running a lot of schedulers, and in turn, we are running a lot of executors, which, which reserve a lot of memory, so this ratio is pretty high. 
but at other times this ratio is less than 0 0.5. So what do we do? We trigger our auto scaling policy every 10 minutes. And the first thing it's supposed to do is to calculate the gull load for our cluster. If the gull load is greater than 0 0.5 and it's less than 0 0.9, we say that we are in state of equilibrium. We don't need to do anything. We have just sufficient resources to entertain any incoming uh, seagull runs and we don't need to really do anything. But if gull load is greater than 0 0.9, that means that we can soon end up in a case where we don't have enough resources to run all the executors that we need to run. And if that happens, we add 10% extra machines. However, once gull, loads, gull load falls below 0 0.5, we are maintaining, we realize that we, may, we are maintaining slaves that we don't need to. And how do we get rid of these slaves? We calculate the gull load for every machine in the cluster, which is the summation of RI, that is we sum up the reserved memory for all the tasks or the executors that are running on this specific machine, and we divide it by MI, which is the total available memory on that machine. We do this for all the machines, we sort the slaves based on their gull load, and we select 10% of the machines which have the lowest gull load and we end up terminating them. Once that is done, we wait for another 10 minutes and we repeat the same process again. We started up with all reserved instances because when we were developing Seagull, we didn't really want it to be fault tolerance right at that time, so we went for reserved instances. But when we moved Seagull to production, it was becoming too expensive. And we shifted to all spot instances. While we were doing that, we always knew that there could be a bad day. And one day, there, the bad day actually happened. We came to work and we realized that all the machines were gone and no one could run any tests. And that was not exciting. So from that day on, we made two separate auto scaling groups. One was for on-demand instances and the other one was for spot instances. Right now, we roughly have 25 instances, 25% 25 of the instances belong to the on-demand auto-scaling group, and the rest of the 75% are spot instances. So let's just change gears and look at how do we actually provide fault tolerance. It's very important for us to have fault tolerance because we have a lot of files at Yelp interacting, given that we are interacting with lots of systems. So there are two kind of levels at which we provide fault tolerance. The way I see it is the first level is the hardware level, which is sort of the preventive fault tolerance. And the other, the other, the other level is the infrastructure level, which is the corrective fault tolerance. So in other words, the preventive fault tolerance is preventing faults to happen, and the corrective fault tolerance, which is what infrastructure ensures, is basically when faults happen, how to deal with them. So part of getting the preventive fault tolerance is equally dividing our Siegel slaves amongst different AZs. Right now, all our Siegel machines are hosted in US West 2 region. And 60 out of the 200 machines are currently in US West 2A, whereas US West 2B and US West 2C each host 66 machines. And the thing I really liked about AWS was about using these EC2 instances. Was there, are, there were a lot of times when, since we are running Docker at scale and we are interacting with other services, that we'll end up doing something bad with individual slaves. And it's very easy to terminate a slave in, in, in EC2 and the auto scaling group will bring up a fresh slave and you can just continue doing, which can just continue doing its work. In the event of losing spot instances, our Seagull runs, they keep on running. Although their performance can degrade depending on how many resources we currently have available. 
but a usual way of dealing with losing spot instances is to increase the number of instances in our on-demand auto-scaling group. And once we have the spot instances back, we get the on-demand instances, we terminate the on-demand instances, and we get some more spot instances to just save some money. So there are a lot of times when things go wrong. And some of the reasons that make things go wrong is that there's a bad service. We, we are interacting with, an, with a service, we send a request and we get a timeout or we keep on waiting or we, we use Docker a lot. At any given time, a slave, a single machine can be running 100 Docker containers simultaneously. And we can, we can we run more than a million containers in a single day. So that can sometimes be problematic. And uh, it's also the fact that we have a lot of external partners and they can have their bad days as well. So that's also a source of uh, causing failures inside Seagull. So what do we do infrastructurally inside Seagull to deal with these failures? So there's this entity inside the scheduler which we call as task manager. All it does is it tracks the life cycle of each executor or task and it retries running a task if it fails or timeouts a specific number of times which the user can specify. So I'm going to demonstrate how we provide fault tolerance in Seagull from an infrastructure point of view. The terminology is the same as I've used before, but I'm just adding one new entity to it, which is a task manager, and it resides inside the scheduler. And it's tracking the life cycle of each executor that a scheduler is running. It's saying, it, tells, it can tell you if it's queued, running, finished, or if it's timed out. So here's one example. A Yelp developer comes in, he does a Seagull run, once he, once the SQL run starts, it creates a scheduler. And the scheduler creates the two bundles that contain the tests that need to run and a task manager. The task manager is supposed to keep track of the life cycle for each of the two bundles that you can see. Mesos makes offer to scheduler C1 for, for, uh, for resources coming from slave S1. The scheduler accepts the resources and Vsauce, in turn, launches the executors on slave S1. So there's, uh, there's a subtle thing to notice over here. So I've, I've labeled S1 to be in US West 2A and slave S2 to be in US West 2B. So let's say if something happens, there's a fire in US West 2A, which causes both the bundles or the executors that were running on slave 1 to crash. Once that happens, Vsauce Mesos realizes that, okay, something went wrong on slave S1, I need to inform scheduler C1 that it's, both of its bundles are now gone. So it sends an update to the task manager that both your bundles are gone. The task manager determines what was the state of these bundles, they were running, and it determines if those bundles need to rerun again. Let's say, in this case, it determines that they need to rerun. Mesos master makes another offer to the scheduler from slave S2. And hopefully, US, uh, since slave S2 is in US West 2B, and hopefully it's not on fire and it's able to run tests. Our scheduler accepts the resources from slave S2 and Mesos launches the same executors on slave S2, which run and then finish to completion. And once they complete, they report their results. And uh, so what did we learn in this talk? We talked about how Seagull works and interacts with other systems. We came to know of uh, an extremely efficient artifact hosting design that is working perfectly for us. We also discussed how do we do auto scaling using our custom metric gull load. And we also talked about how we use AWS for providing fault tolerance and the infrastructure retry logic that Seagull has to deal with failures. 
Moving forward, we really want to open source Seagull. And we have been trying to do it for the last few months. The only reason is we don't get enough time to sanitize the code, clean up, and do everything that's required for open sourcing it. But we do really want to do it. Hopefully, we'll do it this quarter. And we also want to explore why Amazon, why downloading artifacts from Amazon S3 was such a big problem. Although we do have a feeling that once we avoid going through the NAT box, we, our results might improve, the download times might improve. But we are also planning to explore some alternatives where we host artifacts into multiple buckets and we divide our large artifact into smaller files and then upload to S3 and combine it when we, when we download uh, all those small files. But we are all, we are very, right now we are very excited to work on getting, making Seagull able to run on multiple instance types. Right now, we only run on R3 8x larges, which is a sort of a scarce commodity at EC2. It's not as easy to get a uh, spot instance, and their prices change a lot, and all those things. But that's one of our major uh, motive these days. And we want to also do that because we want to reduce the cost of our Seagull cluster. And one way we think of doing it is by, by using the right instance type, which is the instance type that would give us the minimum gigabyte per dollar. And it's a very interesting field to work in. Uh, we, don't, we are not aware of a lot of work that has been done in this uh, field, but uh, we definitely want to focus on it. And uh, a friend of mine who recently co-founded a company by the name of Yota Scale, they're also trying to attack similar problem. And uh, yeah, we are very excited to work on it. And with that, I would remind you to complete your evaluations. And I, I think there is time for questions after the talk. Thank you.